From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. And let me welcome you back to the Cannabis Podcast for one more time. Thank you so much for coming back, or maybe this is your very first time. If it is, well, an especially warm welcome for you. Ahead, 30 or 40 minutes of information about a plant I'm absolutely passionate about, and that is cannabis. Perhaps you are too. That may be why you're here. Now, before we get too much further, let me remind you this program is intended for those 19 or older in your jurisdiction and is intended primarily for entertainment and perhaps educational purposes. You should always consume your cannabis responsibly. In episode 147, we have a conversation with Daniel Baer from Humber College in Toronto about a new program they have of getting great cannabis information out through pharmacists. It's a great conversation. Stay tuned for that. Another cannabis store gets some penalty for selling to a minor. And we're going to recap a story about my brother Bill involved with my parents and an interesting pancake breakfast. All of that and more on episode 147 of the Cannabis Podcast. Thank you so much for being here. I truly appreciate the fact that you are a listener. And I also want to thank my supporters at buymeacoffee.com slash Cannabis Podcast. Jordan, Kevin, and Jordana, thank you so much for the support. As we move over to Patreon, my patrons, I want to thank Tony, Roger, Gage, Rob, and Lloyd. I appreciate your support each and every time. And now I'd like to introduce you to Daniel Baer. Daniel is a researcher at Humber College in Toronto. He's been studying cannabis for 20 years. He began studying cannabis, using it to recover from a serious assault that left him with a traumatic brain injury and PTSD. His work, at least for the last decade or so, has focused on creating better cannabis public education campaigns that are stigma-free and evidence-based. He reached out to me because he's working on a research project in partnership with the Canadian Pharmacists Association to help develop new education materials for pharmacists across the country. They'll be developing new in-store materials so people who consume cannabis will have both a knowledgeable person they can talk to and materials that can help ensure safe and positive experiences with cannabis. We recently spoke about the Weed Out Misinformation campaign that Daniel and his team developed. That was so they could hear from consumers what they wanted in access to medical professionals, but didn't necessarily want to have to visit their physician, even if they had access to one. So today, we're having a conversation with Daniel who is the director at Humber Centre for Social Innovation, Faculty of Social and Community Services, Humber College in Toronto. I started the conversation by asking Daniel where his cannabis journey began. So when I was uh, 16, uh, potentially I got jumped and um, uh, it was not fun. And in fact, I got knocked out uh, after a short while trying to protect a friend. And um, while I was unconscious, I got kicked in the face repeatedly. And, uh, you know, the movies make it seem like, you know, you can bounce back or something like that. But uh, I had a traumatic brain injury, PTSD, and I was 16. Um, and I, you know, when you're 16, you think you're invincible. And when you suddenly realize you're not, it, it's a lot to process. And, you know, it was the late 90s and um, opioids were prescribed when you had serious facial trauma like I did. Um, but you know, opioids are are not great at a lot of things. Temporary pain relief, okay, but I couldn't function, couldn't go to school, uh, constipated as hell. Um, so you know, it wasn't until a friend actually said, "Hey, do you want to smoke a little weed?" And I'd smoked cannabis once. Uh, I'd watched uh, the movie Heat and found it amazing. And um, I said, "Sure, why not?" And I wasn't at a place where I could understand exactly what had happened to me when I consumed cannabis, but all of a sudden I knew that I wasn't hurting as much and that I didn't feel, I, I didn't care about the pain as much. It's not that all the pain went away. It's that I didn't care about it as much. And in very short order, I was able to go back to school and the teachers were saying, Hey, it's so great that you're back in class. And I couldn't tell them I'm high as shit right now, <laughs> um, you know, and, and it was a long process of having to figure out what was actually going on for me. I was in California and we had legalized medical cannabis a couple years previously. Um, but it really started dawning on me that this thing that I was having to hide and was helping me was also leading to friends being arrested. Um, and I began to see a difference between how my white friends were being treated when they were caught with cannabis versus how some of my racialized friends were being treated. And it started to dawn on me, wait a sec, there's something going on here. Like there's, there's something bigger than just my experience. And 
it's a rabbit hole that I jumped in then and, and haven't emerged from since. <laughs> and and it sounds like the, the from that perspective though it's a good rabbit hole Daniel in exactly. you're getting some great information out of that and, and you've got some some ideas for some improvements we made let me give a, a bit of a background to what you're doing at Humber so uh, Daniel has been studying cannabis for the last 20 years he began studying his cannabis to recover from the serious assault which we just heard about uh, in the last decade or so he's been focused on creating better cannabis public education campaigns that are stigma free and evidence based and I just love that Daniel I've taken a look at the website that you got, have created with you and your group at Humber the weedoutinformation.ca that's a great place to start but you want to take that uh, even a little further don't you you want to you want to get some more information from cannabis users and how better education from pharmacists could help us all Exactly. The Weed Out Misinformation uh, campaign that we built was built with cannabis consumers and bud tenders and public health experts. And, you know, it revealed a lot of interesting information to us. We thought there was going to be differences in knowledge and knowledge needed, education needs based on age. But actually, it turned out it was really about whether you were a frequent consumer or infrequent consumer that dictated the kind of knowledge you needed. But the one consistent thing we did see was that people wanted to engage with medical professionals, with experts, with people they could trust. We saw from our research that people were going to their friends for most of their information, but they didn't trust the information that was coming from their friends. And so we also saw that they didn't really trust their physicians all that much. Uh, they found the experiences they're stigmatizing or not with the knowledge they needed. So we tried to identify a low barrier access to medical knowledge. And what we came up with was pharmacists. There are about 48,000 pharmacists across Canada. They are in every town. They have a high level of medical training. And in fact, many of the uh, universities that grant uh, pharmacy degrees do include some discussion of cannabis. Usually it's very limited and related to things like drug interactions. And we thought, well, what if we turn that workforce that's spread all across Canada and that people can enter relatively easily, right? You just have to walk into your neighborhood pharmacy. And what if we train them with the information they needed to effectively interact with a cannabis consumer? That's not just chemistry properties. That's not just drug interactions. That is how do you actually understand what people are looking for? How do you speak the same language as someone who's consuming cannabis? And then provide the resources in store so that you can have a, as a pharmacist say, hey, we're gonna have a couple minutes of conversation. I can't spend an hour with you but I can now direct you to some alternative resources. And so that's what we're working on right now. We're just launching the survey and we're looking to speak to cannabis consumers and to cannabis pharmacists so that we can hear from them what they already know, what they want to know, and how they want these uh, new materials and ideas to be developed. After we do the survey, we're gonna then run focus groups. After the focus groups, we're gonna build a draft of the new materials using students at Humber College in our Bachelor of Creative Advertising because they got great skills and they built the Weed Out Misinformation campaign last time. And then we're going to go back to cannabis consumers and pharmacists and say, is this what you were looking for? Is this free of stigma? Does this have the kind of information you need? Is it presenting evidence in the way that you need? And the goal is to be able to build a continuing education platform for pharmacists and then in-store materials so that when you walk into a cannabis shop, oh, sorry, <laughs> Freudian slip there. When you walk into a pharmacy in the future, uh, you'll be able to have a pretty good sense that your pharmacist has the kind of information you need, whether as a recreational or medical consumer, that you can talk to them, that you can be open with them, and that they can provide you harm reduction information and say, hey, listen, you know, you're telling me that you're frequently consuming. Have you thought about like a dryer vaporizer? Can I help you uh, understand dosing of CBD? Because God knows everybody needs more help with that. Um, so the idea there is that we can really empower pharmacists to be a conduit of information to the community. I think it's brilliant that, that you selected that area of the medical profession to, to, to focus on, because I know in my experience with talking with various cannabis consumers, and you say, well, have you talked to your doctor about that? And they say, oh, yeah, right. They're, they're not paying any attention. I'm not getting any kind of comfort or, or relevance there. So having a medical professional and, and pharmacist, is, as you say, it's somebody we see on a very frequent basis. That's just brilliant. Where did the idea come from of, of hooking up with the pharmacist? You know, it's tough to say the, the exact origin of it, but it was, the, it was the information we were getting from people that was saying, I don't like the physician. I don't want to talk to my physician. It's too close of a relationship. You know, they've, 
they've seen me naked. They've <laughs> done all sorts of exams on me. They know my name. They know my history. And pharmacists, they're low barrier for entry and they're ubiquitous across Canada. But one of the nice thing is there's a little bit of a, a distance there, right? I, I jokingly say my pharmacist didn't know my name until I turned 40 and then started <laughs> showing up there more. <laughs> um, but it's true. Like you, how many people know the name of their pharmacist? I guarantee you it's it's far, far fewer than know the name of their physician. And so we were just talking about it. Our, our team was trying to figure out what the next steps were. And uh, I was talking with uh, two pharmacists at Memorial University of Newfoundland, um, Jennifer Donan and Lisa Bishop, who are now part of this research project. And I was talking with them about research they were doing. And I said, what if we tried going for pharmacists? You're pharmacists. You both have clinical experience. You have retail experience. You have uh, researcher experience. What do you think about this idea? And they thought it was great. And we, we sort of just built out the project from there. What an excellent idea. Really happy about that. So give me a sense of how that has happened, Daniel. The, you, you started having some talk, got some pharmacists involved. You obviously have some students at Humber, which are helping you do this. So how did we get to the Weed Out Misinformation site? Where, where did that come from? So Weed Out Misinformation uh, well, launched in March of 2020. We got the notification about the grant about 10 days before COVID closed everything down, <laughs> of uh, <course>. which dramatically... <laughs> shifted our plan from doing live in-person uh, focus groups all around Canada to suddenly we had to learn how to do them online, like, you know, like everything else. But that project came out of my own experiences, you know, going back to uh, my own traumatic incident back in the 90s, when I was trying to figure out how to safely consume cannabis, I, I didn't have any resources. There was nowhere I could turn. And what I'd been taught as a young person was that drugs are bad. And in fact, uh, in school in Los Angeles, I had been taught by the DARE officer that heroin and marijuana were equally addictive and equally risky. And so I was a little in fear for my life when I was consuming cannabis because it was helping me. But I also was like, man, I'm going to be addicted. What am I going to do here? And, I, you know, I did things like smoke out of a, a crushed Coke can, right? Like that's horrible for you. But I didn't know any better. You know, I've done a lot of research in the intervening uh, two decades. I worked with medical cannabis consumers looking at how they used cannabis as a way of creating community, uh, particularly for terminally ill patients. I spent a long time looking at the policing of cannabis. But once legalization came about, I thought, you know, I want to do something that benefits Canadian society. I'm an American who came here thanks to my, my wonderful wife. Um, and I thought, you know, I really, I really enjoy being in Canada. What can I do that undoes some of the harm that I experienced and provides something that helps people so they don't have to go through what I went through? And the idea was, well, let's build a better public education campaign. Let's make it stigma free. Let's make it harm reduction focused. And in fact, let's take a step further and let's talk about benefit maximization, which means let's talk about how to have a good, positive experience when consuming drugs. That involves also, you know, limiting the risks, reducing the harms. But it also asks, what do you want out of this experience? Because no one ever asked me that when I was consuming to try and deal with flashbacks or to deal with pain. No one ever said, well, why are you consuming cannabis? I would have told them, well, when I consume cannabis, my anxiety goes down, I don't have flashbacks, I feel a lot better, I can function. All I heard around me was, this is illegal, this is dangerous, and it didn't help me. And in fact, you know, I, I, I overly used cannabis back in those days. I relied on it, I, I became, I say dependent in the sense of like, it helped me get through the day, not necessarily in the, in the sense of addiction or anything. But I was, I was smoking way too much. I was, for a young person, I didn't have the information I needed. And if someone had said back then, you know, listen, don't go for the highest THC or the highest product you can get. It's actually safer for you to have a lower THC product, given that you're a young person, given that you're consuming frequently. Here's what a drier vape is. This is what you should consider. That kind of information would have been very helpful. And so that's what we wanted to do with weed out misinformation is, is create something that just didn't exist before. What's been the most insightful piece of information you've, you've garnered out of, out of this, your journey so far? Oh, interesting. Um, you know, our survey revealed quite a lot uh, about the consumption patterns and the habits of people 18 to 30 who consume cannabis. One of the most interesting things that came out of it for me was the, um, how do I put this? The it was the way in which they were engaging with knowledge and information. And 
I, I kind of thought, you know, I'm in my early 40s now. And I thought, well, this is a generation that's grown up with the internet. They've always had access to it. Surely they are going to be incredibly proficient at finding information and accessing those sites. And what we found was that overwhelmingly people were going to their friends for information, but at the same time telling us in their surveys that they didn't trust their friends' information. They were also telling us that they really trusted research articles, academics, professors, medical practitioners, but they also identified at the same time that they weren't accessing those resources. They had high trust in them, but they weren't going to them. Now, part of that is because so much science is behind a paywall and so often, you know, scientific publications don't then take the next step, which is creating knowledge translation efforts to take the scientific journal article and bring it into a usable format for people, both, you know, free to access, but also in language that they can understand and comprehend and then utilize in an applied manner in their own lives. And I, I was kind of surprised by that. I thought for sure they'd be accessing that information. And whenever we showed them examples of cannabis education campaigns that had references, they lit up. They said, oh, that's exactly what I want. I want to know where to go so that I can read that article. You know, even, uh, even individuals who didn't have a college education were saying, I want to be able to go and read this, even if it's just the abstract. And so one of the things we did with Weed Out Misinformation was that we made sure that on our website, all of the sources that we used in our project are listed in a references section. And some of them are behind paywall, but whatever uh, sources we could find that weren't behind a paywall, we included those links to them so that as people are going through the website, if they have questions, they can go to the references section and it's broken down by category so that they can start digging and doing some of their own research. Yeah, I, I found that really useful and, and it, it was well organized to, to dive into to that information. So let's talk about the survey that, that you're creating now to get that more information. What's being done to generate that and, and where we might be able to find it? Yeah, so the survey is uh, launching now, and we've spent a long time trying to find the right balance of the kinds of questions that we're including, the amount of questions. As you can imagine, you put six researchers into a room, we've got an initial survey that takes you 45 minutes to complete. <laughs> we've whittled that down quite a bit. And so we're looking at a bunch of different things uh, with people's consumption. We want to understand how they're consuming cannabis. We also want to know where they're getting information what kind of information they want. We have a bit of that knowledge from our last survey, but we also want to understand the types of practices or engagement that they have with other cannabis sources, because there's no point in creating access and knowledge in the pharmacies that duplicates exactly what they're getting elsewhere or isn't what they want. And so we're really taking a concerted effort to understand how they uh, want to engage with the types of knowledge that might be available, and then looking at uh, their understanding of their own cannabis consumption practices. Because if a pharmacist just has, you know, um, drug interaction knowledge, or just has this is how much CBD you need to treat X condition, that's part of the way there. But we want to be able to help pharmacists understand how cannabis consumers see themselves. How are they talking about their cannabis consumption? How are they internally creating a narrative about what their cannabis consumption means to them? And so the survey gets at that a little bit. The, uh, the focus groups are going to expand on that even more. And that way we'll be able to really make sure that it's an effective uh, opportunity when they, they do go in and talk to a pharmacist who's been through the continuing education platform that we're going to build. So as this is all developing in front of you, Daniel, where do you see success? What is what is going to be the success metric for you when, when this is done? That's a great question. Um, you know, as a research institution focused on applied work, we can't create um, a, a campaign that's going to last forever, right? We, we can identify the issues. We can build this applied campaign our partners at the Canadian Pharmacy Association, uh, the Canadian Public Health Association, and the Canadian Center for Substance Abuse are going to take this work in a few years once the research component ends, and they'll be able to keep the continuing education uh, work going. They'll be able to keep the flyers and the, the other material going. And in my mind, success is that this project lives on so that as new pharmacists come into the field every year, they have this continuing education material that they can take because they have a requirement every year to you know, keep learning, keep growing, um, but that there's also constantly updated materials that are always available in every pharmacy in Canada 
that people can access and take home with them. Those materials will take them back to another website uh, that has information, sort of like weed out misinformation, uh, but targeted a bit differently. And so maybe it sounds a bit grand, but my idea of success is that this project continues to live on through our partners. As, as researchers, we can get the information to build it. We can build it because we're at a college. You know, Our goal is applied research, not just theoretical. Uh, but my goal is that this lives on for you know hopefully decades and that over time the material continues to be updated uh, that as we find out new more new and more information about cannabinoids that that continues to get added in because i mean we're learning so much about the hundred or so other cannabinoids that are out there i can't imagine what in 10 or 12 years it's going to look like when you go to buy cannabis the label's going to say thc cbd cbn cbg cbc <laughs> and then 20 others below it probably yeah, absolutely and, all the terpenes and everything else <laughs> exactly and with any luck we'll get genetic testing down so we'll be able to match your endocannabinoid system to a you know an exact profile of of cannabinoids and terpenes that that work just quite right for you um and it, it, when that happens we'll still need updated information so i, I hopeful you know i'm in my early 40s now as i said and hopefully when i'm retiring and i, I walk in on a quiet Wednesday afternoon on a long walk out with my wife, I walk into a pharmacy to pick something up on our way home and look, there's the version 10 of the uh, information packet that we developed all the way back then. That would be fabulous. That's a, that's a good insight. And, and I hope we get there. Just the idea of, you know, in a couple of years from now, being able to walk into a pharmacy in Canada and to be able to get some some cannabis knowledge from someone that you know is, is trained in that. I think this is, this is just brilliant. I'm, I'm really happy with your idea. Excellent. Yeah, I appreciate it. You know, this... This strives to hit the public health goal mm -hmm. that was a key element of the Cannabis Act and is evidenced in, in many ways that aren't particularly effective and that aren't bringing people into the legal cannabis system. They're well-intentioned by all means, I'm sure, but not necessarily aligned with the needs of cannabis consumers. And so we hope that this project meets people where they're at, provides them information they need so that they can have a safe and enjoyable cannabis experience. So another question I have for you, uh, Daniel, Do are you still a cannabis consumer? I am, yeah. So why don't I, uh, I hit my uh, hot seat questions and, and, go for and see where we go from that perspective. So what would Sounds be your great. favorite cultivar? Uh, I honestly can't say that I have a favorite cultivar. Um, I do like the name of the Dr. Uh, Grinspoon, uh, mostly because Lester Grinspoon was such a a leader in the cannabis field. I can tell you, while I don't have a specific name, I like a very balanced product, something with a really broad cannabinoid profile, um, usually under 20% THC if I'm having flour. But I'll be honest, most of the time these days, it's like a two, two and a half milligram edible. That's my, <laughs> my go-to. I'm a lightweight. What can I say? Okay. Well, that, that's all right, because that's another one of my questions, flour or edibles. <laughs> you know, I... I I rarely uh, smoke flour. I, um, if I do, it's out of a dryer vape because yeah. I find that you get much better flavor there, much totally less smoke, agree. and much uh, much easier on the lungs. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I'd say, you know, if we're looking purely at a you know consumption pattern, uh, I would say edibles. Okay. Uh, joints or vape? Oh, vape. Yeah. yeah no question. Yeah. yeah. Listen, I, I joints are fun at a fish concert, um, and they're fun uh, <laughs> on a hike. Um, but, uh, most of the time other than that, if I consume cannabis, it's, uh, it's through a vape, yeah. Dry yeah. or, uh, or oil. Okay. Excellent. This is one that I've, uh, I just found across our country. Everybody has a different terminology for three and a half grams of cannabis. Since you, you come from California originally, what was three and a half grams referred to in your world? Uh, that was always an eighth, an eighth uh, okay. or a 20 sack. Um, a but, 20 uh, sacks, you know, that's a new term. <laughs> yeah. But that, I mean, that was a California thing because back in the day, yeah, you could get a uh, you could get an eighth for well, no, actually, no. Wait, was it twenty sack that? No, it, you could. It was um, it was not very good though. <laughs> it was definitely not sense in the <laughs> Well, that's an entirely uh, different discussion. <laughs> yeah, no, there were definitely um, there were times growing up in California, we were at this really interesting intersection because you had Northern California uh, and the Emerald Triangle up there, where stuff would come down from there. But w in Los Angeles, we were also very close to Mexico, and so you had. Mexican swag weed that would come up and, you know, you'd, you'd buy a bit of it and you'd still see it like the corner of where it had been packed into like the kilo brick. You could still like see that corner chunk and they're just full of seeds and stuff. <laughs> yeah. We, we had a lot of weed from Mexico up here back yeah. in the day too. And, yeah. and it was questionable in, in terms of the quality of it all. Well, and also, I mean, back in the day, you know, who knows what it had on us a paraquat or something. So, you know, I, I look at the legal market now and I, I think about the growth regulators and stuff that people are using 
um, in some illicit grow operations and even in home growing and yeah. how they're, they're definitely probably not great for you. And it might no. not be quite as, uh, dangerous as Paraquat or some of the other things that were used back in the day, but yeah. I do appreciate the, um, and I know people have complaints about Health Canada's approach to, to regulating and pesticides and things like that. But I'll tell you, I went down to New York uh, a couple weeks ago and uh, their cannabis scene down there is a gong show. And when I asked one of the folks, oh, what's the sort of testing that goes on to you know check for adulterants or chemicals or yeah. you know things like that on there? He's like, I don't know. We don't really do much. <laughs> so I was like, oh, OK. So definitely appreciated uh, Health cannabis, Health Canada there. There's things that we can fix. There's clearly some changes that, that would would love to happen and, and improve our industry. But the fact that we have reached legalization and, and five years into it now, uh, it's a whole different world. I really like the approach you're taking, Daniel. I'm, I have been a big believer in we have to deal with stigma. We, we've got to just hit that head on and just knock it down. That's one of the things I see as a positive with both your Weed Out Misinformation campaign and the new survey that you're doing. Do you agree stigma is, is a, a huge thing that we just have to keep pounding on? Oh, yeah, most certainly. I, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I wouldn't have answered your questions uh, about my cannabis consumption. Sure. Um, it's definitely something where I've gotten looks before. I remember... I was at a meeting with some folks uh, several years ago who I'd been out to drinks with uh, after an event. Um, several times I'd been to drinks with them. And I talked about, uh, I mentioned cannabis consumption and everybody clammed up. Like, <laughs> oh, you, you can't talk about it. That's not a thing we talk about. And I looked around the room and I said, I know for a fact several of you consume cannabis. And I know that I've been to drinks with all of you. Why is this suddenly some verboten topic? It's true. And, uh, you know, our research with young people, it keeps coming back with the same thing. There's, they see stigma all over the place. And, and you know, in, at least in my line of work, it's a huge impediment because yeah. if they get that whiff of stigma, it turns them off from the rest of the messaging. And so no matter how well-intentioned or scientifically accurate it is, if it doesn't feel like it's coming from a place that is stigma-free and there to support them, then they turn off from it. And that doesn't mean that they get turned off from any messages that point out potential harms or ways yeah. of reducing potential harms, they get turned off when it feels like they're being made to feel like another. Yeah. And uh, you know, getting rid of that is is going to be it's going to take time. I, I jokingly say, you know, uh, not to get too biblical on it, but uh, you know, I jokingly say, you know, in the Bible, after the Jews were freed from Egypt from slavery, they had to wander the desert for forty years because you had to get rid of that slave mentality, and then then and only then could they enter the land of Israel, right? And it's like. Yeah. Yeah, no, we kind of do that here. We got to get rid of this old mentality <laughs> for a century of yeah. prohibition where we told everybody this is awful and horrible. Yeah. And, you know, it, it it takes a long time to get rid of that stigma, to get rid of that ingrained sense of what it is. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I can report success in that. My father, who told me growing up that if he ever caught me with cannabis, he'd take me to the cops himself, now asks me for advice and nice. says, well, you know, I'm looking at these new gummies and uh, which do you think I should get, this one or this one? And I, I just have to hope that everybody else can shift as far as he has. Yeah, that's a change in the right direction. Yeah. Really happy to hear that. Well, excellent conversation, Daniel. Really happy about what you guys are doing at Humber College with the, the program that you're doing, all the research you've been do doing for the last 20 years is setting up for some success for all of us. Any final words for you, Daniel? No, I just uh, would say that I really would appreciate if anybody listening to this can take the sort of 10 to 12 minutes to go and uh, take our survey Last time we were able to gather 1,598 responses to our weed out misinformation nice. survey. I'm hoping that with this survey, we can go even farther. Uh, we're trying to avoid giving any money to social media companies. Uh, <laughs> are there any paid advertisements to get responses? So yeah. uh, your help in, uh, in, in getting us there would be really appreciated. We're gonna use the information provided in this survey to make products, uh, well, I say products, educational resources really. Mm -hmm that are going to be there to benefit all Canadians. So appreciate your time and uh, helping us learn a little bit more about cannabis consumers. Well, excellent. Thank you for your time. And, and, and you're obviously heading in the right direction. you got some great thoughts. It's going to help all of us in the future. Thanks so much, Daniel. I really appreciate it and hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Cheers. Thank you so much. So if all of that sounds interesting to you, why don't you go and do the survey? It's at www.cannabiseducationresearch.ca. And I've also put a link to it at the Cannabis Podcast Show page. Again, that's www.cannabiseducationresearch.ca. Don't think about it. Don't wait. Go and do the survey now so they get lots of responses and we'll get some really good education in the future. THC, 
CBD Terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me Go to the corner Go to the corner, oh yeah Go to the corner, please explain this stuff to me And on Cultivar Corner today, we're heading back to Vancouver Island. We've had some good weed from there before with Victoria Cannabis Company. And now we're going to Orchard Cannabis. So let's give you the story on Orchard. At Orchard, skilled fruit and berry cultivators have united with craft Vancouver Island cannabis growers dedicated to the art and science of this extraordinary plant. We're honored to be the stewards of fertile farmland in the Saanich Peninsula in beautiful British Columbia, a local landmark since 1960. Our farm has been in continuous production and a community gathering place for generations. Orchard is committed to cultivation using organic methods, and we take pride in showcasing talented local and regional growers who are dedicated to the present and future of cannabis. And that's a good dedication to be involved with. So Orchard Cannabis is what we're doing today. And let's get to the details of the actual cultivar we are talking about today. And that is one of their beauties that is out here, and that is Granddaddy Gelati. What's the lineage of Granddaddy Gelati? Well, probably not a surprise that Granddaddy Purple is sitting way up there, <laughs> along with Purple Power and Gelati. It's sativa dominant. The top terpenes are myrcene, osamine, alpha pinene, and linalool. And the aromas are hops, earthy pine, lavender, and cinnamon. And I've already popped the bag, no snap to the bag, but moved it into a jar. Oh, <laughs> ah, there's just something magical, isn't there, about opening a jar of cannabis and sticking your nose inside and just fighting those wonderful aromas. Oh, the total terpenes on this could explain why this is so aromatic. 4.33% is my total terps. Oh, beta myrcene at 1.7, osamine 1.16, alpha pinene 0.41, and linalool at 0.20. I'm going to pull out one of these lovely little buds. Oh, boy, that's trimmed so nicely. No sticks visible. No sugar leaves visible. Let me do a little bit on the trichomes. Oh, there's some nice trichome fields there. Okay, so we got a, a dark green with lots of orange kind of red pistol hairs sticking out there. Let's pull one of those buds out. Let's check its stickiness. Oh, pretty sticky. Even stickier as I break that up. And, oh my goodness, you just squish one of those buds and the aroma just smacks you in the face. <laughs> wow. So, Granddaddy Gelati, a refreshing strain that combines the sweetness of ripe apple, pear, and tree fruit with the creamy essence of bananas. With balanced effects, the sativa dominant strain takes you on a tranquil and flavorful journey with every earthy and smooth inhale. Expertly grown on Vancouver Island by Verity West and carefully processed and packaged by the Orchard team. And I picked up the seven gram package of the Orchard Granddaddy Gelati. And after all that introduction, <laughs> I think it's time we had a taste. This is Orchard Cannabis from Vancouver Island and their Granddaddy Gelati. First in the joint. Oh, nice aromas on that one. Hops, earthy, pine, lavender, and cinnamon, the flavors that I should be expecting. Oh, picking up on those earthy notes, certainly on the inhale. Probably heavy on the myrcene. I'm not picking up the creamy essence of bananas, but I tend to not pick up many of those. Now, that's probably going to be the osamine that's giving us some of those candy flavors or fruit flavors. All right. Another hit on the joint of the Granddaddy Gelati. Now again, THC is sitting at, what's my THC? 28.7. And my total terps at 4.33. Mmm, starting to roll around in my endocannabinoid system rather nicely. Let's put the joint aside for a moment and let's have a taste of the weed <laughs> in the Ariser Air Max. This is Granddaddy Gelati. <laughs> And once again, wow. <laughs> the taste is just astounding when you put it in the vaporizer. Talk about those aromas of hops, earthy, pine, lavender, and cinnamon. There's a little bit of each of those when you pull that through the vaporizer. <laughs> 
Oh, and here come the happy eyes. Hmm. Very nice head forward, Sativa. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, and here they come in stronger. I just love that feeling, don't you? <laughs> intention? My intention in Cultivar Corner is always pretty, pretty simple. <laughs> Does the weed get me a buzz? And again, in typical fashion for a cultivar quarter, this is the first of the day. And get a true understanding of what this weed is going to do to me. Granddaddy Gelati from Orchard Cannabis on Vancouver Island. <laughs> oh, it's coming on nice and strong now. A really nice, clear headstone. Oh, I love those sativas. And the taste through the Air Riser Air Max is just, mm, just absolutely delicious. But the joint in and of itself is, is pretty smooth too. I don't think that I have coughed once through this little exercise. So let me fire up the joint for one more last hit and get one more off the Air Max. Uh, and there goes my endocannabinoid system, enjoying it all. Yeah, nice and smooth, nice and smooth. So another part of British Columbia, <laughs> known for growing some good cannabis, is still continuing their reputation. And Verte West, we've heard a lot about Verte West. They've grown for a number of different people, I think, over the last few years. Nice to have their name out, knowing that they're the ones who grew this granddaddy gelati for orchard cannabis. 29, no, 28.72% THC, 4.33% terps. <laughs> And once more, I am happy to say at the end of a cultivar corner, I'm really blasted. <laughs> this is a lovely headstone. Ah, it's all right up there. The euphoria is strong. My happy eyes are strong. <laughs> this is going to be a really nice day. <laughs> more fine weeds from the areas of British Columbia. This from the Saanich area of Vancouver Island. Orchard Cannabis, the company who produced it and distributed it. Verte West, the people who grew it, they, they grew some pretty fine weed. <laughs> Hello, Granddaddy Gelati, you made my day. And as is sometimes required, after the endocannabinoid system has had a chance to mm, encapsulate, <laughs> take in all of the THC and the other cannabinoids that are rolling through my system, through my CB1 and CB2 receptors at the moment, <laughs> You may, you may get a sense by the fact that I'm rambling a little bit here. This is a really nice buzz. <laughs> it, it came into much more of a euphoria, much more of a happy kind of feeling. Um, just feeling kind of giddy, feeling <laughs> feeling really good. And, and I wanted to share that with you because it's always good to know how the weed is going to take you there. Now, of course, your reaction could be completely different. This is cannabis, of course. Your endocannabinoid system may react differently than mine, but mine is having a blast today. <laughs> with Orchard Granddaddy Gelati. Sharing stories about good weed while trying good weed. This is the Cannabis Podcast. We've already talked about the fact that the BC government, or at least the enforcement division of the BC government, has been doing some checking on cannabis stores, certainly in the Kelowna area, looking for people selling to minors without checking for ID. And I know that's been going on ever since the first legal liquor store opened. <laughs> People have been coming in and buying it underage for years, still happening in cannabis stores. But I'm amazed at the lax nature of some of the cannabis stores. So this is a story from castanet.net. A Kelowna cannabis store will be closed for a week next month after being caught selling THC gummies to a 16-year-old. According to a decision from the BC Liquor and Cannabis Regulation Branch, Prime Cannabis on Pandozi Street, sold a five-pack of cannabis gummies to an undercover miner working with inspectors on November 30, 2023. After the teenager made the purchase with $20 in cash and was not asked for ID by the bud tender, an inspector, also in the store, informed the bud tender of the contravention. The bud tender took full responsibility for his mistake, said the ruling. The store did not dispute the contravention, but raised the defense of due diligence at a hearing trying to argue that the business had procedures in place to prevent the sale of product to underage people. Prime Cannabis also changed its ID policy after the incident and now requires staff to ID anyone who looks to be under the age of 40. Signs have been posted to our doors. The penalty for selling cannabis to a minor in British Columbia is a minimum of $7,000 fine or close our business for seven days. 
said a notice distributed to staff. This penalty threatens our ability for Prime Cannabis to stay in business and keep everyone employed. This is a significant risk to our company and all staff. The Cannabis Control Board, however, rejected the pot shop's defense. There are a number of weaknesses in the licensee's policies and practice. The licensee has failed to produce sufficient documentation to establish due diligence, the decision states, noting there are some inconsistencies about a secret shopper program at the store. It remains unclear if that program was operating before the contravention. The ruling also found a Prime Cannabis Standard Operating Procedures document confusing and recommended training checklists be put in place. The shop was ordered to close for seven days starting on April 3, 2024, with signs displayed in a prominent location informing the public of the suspension. After a separate inspection of the Flora Cannabis in West Kelowna caught the store selling cannabis to a minor in September 26, 2023, the Cannabis Control Board accepted that shop's defense of due diligence and set aside a penalty. The bud tender in that case was terminated due to Flora Cannabis' zero-tolerance policy of selling to minors. Flora submitted evidence of its secret shopper program and other documentation related to training around IG checks. I find that the bud tender's failure to request ID of the minor agent was an unfortunate one-time oversight by the bud tender, who had been trained well and had, up to this time, been a good and trusted employee at the cannabis retail store, the decision said. Unfortunately for the bud tender, the licensee's strict policy of terminating any employees who sold to a minor agent was the consequence. I find that the licensee has a strong culture of compliance with every effort being made to ensure its staff in the store are well trained in the licensee's corporate policies and are reminded every day of the responsibility of not selling cannabis to minors. And there you go. There's going to be more of those happening over the next little while, I am sure. Another store gets caught selling cannabis to a minor. And now, as we usually do, let's end with a little bit of cannabis humor to finish off our day. The police say that they'll burn all the weed they confiscate. That would explain the donuts. Studies have shown that smoking weed causes short-term memory loss. Next thing you know, they'll be saying smoking weed causes short-term memory loss. I stopped smoking weed the day after I spent 30 minutes looking for my phone under the bed while using my phone's flashlight. <laughs> and that has happened to almost every one of us. <laughs> and let's finish with another story for you today. And this going back a few years, this involves my brother Bill and my parents. <laughs> They had come to visit us. We were living in Nelson at the time. We had a great place on the north side of the lake. And my brother Bill and I, along with some other friends, had celebrated the night before while my parents were out visiting some other friends in Nelson. They came back home, went to bed. And, and what was going on while they were out of the house was, and I'm not sure why, I don't remember using a blender for a lot of weed, but in this particular instance, we had a bunch of homegrown. I think it was a buddy who was a little further down the lake that I had picked it up from. And I had a bunch of homegrown, and for whatever reason, I ground it up in the blender. I still don't understand why. That's one area where you don't have a memory, and, you, and you're trying to find those details, and they're just not there. But I did. I ground up a bunch of weed in the blender, and then I forgot to clean the blender out. <laughs> we went to bed. Bill went home, came back the next morning to have some breakfast with us and my parents, who were now back, and, and they were up. And I'm busy building everything for the breakfast. Got the bacon cooking. I got the maple syrup ready. I got the pancakes going. And there's an interesting hint to the pancakes today. And that's when I remember that I forgot to clean out the blender. <laughs> now, if it had just been me and my parents, it probably would have slid by and nobody would have noticed or said anything. But my brother Bill was there. <laughs> And this was one of the things that Bill always did. He, he pointed out things that might make you perhaps a little uncomfortable in the situation. So there we are, gathered around the breakfast table. Pancakes are distributed. They're all on the plates. They've been buttered. They've been maple syruped. My dad's taking his first bite, and my brother says, Gary, what's all this little green specks in the pancakes? <laughs> and I was dumbfounded. I did not have a response. I, I, I think I stood there where I was, think I sat there and stared at my brother with some evil eyes daring back at him. To, Why did you bring that up? <laughs> I made some excuse. I don't know whether I said it was oregano or something green. But my parents who didn't pay too much attention to drug references, fortunately, <laughs> ate their pancakes, never paid any attention to it. Now, did they behave a little differently that day? I'm not sure if they did or not. <laughs> But that was one of the things that my brother Bill always did. If you were in a situation and there was an opportunity for him to point out something that might make you a little uncomfortable, <clears throat> he would do it. And he did that with my weed pancakes. And that wraps it up. 
for episode 147 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the Cannabis Infused Studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. Hi, y'all. I'm Joe, host of Casually Baked the Podcast. If you're curious to explore the highly responsible side of cannabis, farming, and legalization, I'm here to help lighten the stigma and build your can of confidence. Download episodes now of Casually Baked the Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. And journey with me through the evolving cannabis culture and discover how and why people like you are adding cannabis to their wellness toolkit. It's time to get casually baked.